It's Wednesday, so you know what time it is. It's Warhammer Wednesday. In today's video, I'm going to teach you the basic flow of gameplay and the basic core rules of how to move your armies, cast powerful space magics, shoot, and finally move in for a big old bit of the old ultra-violent fisticuffs. I'm Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. This is a series called Warhammer Wednesday where I talk to you about my new addiction, which is little plastic men and how they fight in the, in the 41st century. So let's talk a bit about that now. In Warhammer 40,000, you feel powerful armies from the distant future of a grim, dark universe. Countless alien races battle for survival or supremacy. Philosophical and religious doctrines come to blows with unfathomable cosmic terrors and alien instincts that cannot and will not be reasoned with. In the grim, dark, distant future, there is only war. These are the Blood Angels, an elite fighting force of the Adeptus Astartes, the Emperor's Space Marines, just a little bit angrier than their not-so-red brethren. They're not so much adept at hand-to-hand -hand combat so much as they are known for their ferocity bordering on complete madness. They will be taking up the fight against the Necrons, an ancient threat that slept for millennia. They now awaken after watching far too much of James Cameron's Terminator and that Brendan Fraser mummy movie. They now trudge or stomp around the battlefields of war-torn universes, looking to destroy the younger races amongst the stars whilst doing a good imitation of a zombie or skeletal horde. They resurrect and they regenerate damage. They're notoriously easy to paint for new starters because of the simple metallic bodies, but don't let them know I said that. The elder species of bygone millennia probably have quite the delicate ego. These two forces here are the same factions that you'll find in the upcoming Indomitus box. So if you're picking that up, you'll be getting similar forces to these, albeit with different actual models, newer, somewhat fancier units. These are not the Indomitus forces themselves. I'm not cool enough to be sent early access kits by Games Workshop, at least not yet. Notice me, senpai. In this video, I'm going to take you through a turn of Warhammer 40,000, focusing on hammering down the core basic rules of the game. If you want to take a look at how the core rules of Night Edition look, well, there is a link in the description below to the official free download of the core rules from Games Workshop. If you're looking to go beyond the core rules and pick up the full comprehensive rules of Night Edition, they release this Saturday on the 25th of July at any good local game store or model shop. You can also buy it, of course, online. The books will be available up online, but supporting your local game store is paramount in these trying times. Offer them an egg, and by egg, I mean your cold hard-earned cash. I'm not going to cover army building or too much of setup today, I'm mostly looking to cover the core rules and give you a feel of gameplay and how turn orders go. So what does a Warhammer 40,000 turn look like? Well, I'm going to give each of these more detail, but to summarise, the turn starts with the command phase where certain special actions occur, the command points and victory points are added to your totals, in many ways you can think of this like the upkeep in Magic the Gathering. Next, we go into the movement phase where you get to move your little men about the battlefield. Then we move on to the psychic phase where powerful space wizards and psychics cast spells or attempt to stop each other from casting spells. They're drawing power out of the literal warp maelstrom and sometimes that can go horribly, horribly wrong. Then we have the shooting phase. Can you guess what we do in that phase? Well, if you guessed shooting, well done. If you didn't guess shooting, then well, uh... Pfft. I, I don't know what to fucking tell you, honestly. After shooting, we go to the charge phase, where your troops can attempt to close the gap between them and the enemy to get into a close combat fist fight. We then move to the fight phase, which is where the aforementioned fist fighting takes place. And finally, we come to morale, where we check to see who has shit their pants and fled the combat. In this instance here, the Blood Angels have won the dice roll, so they get to go first this turn, so let's get going. Battle rounds are what collections of turns are referred to, so we enter battle round one, where both players will take their first turn. Once both of those turns are finished, we move on to battle round two, so on and so forth. Most 9th edition games that you play will be made up of five total battle rounds, ten turns, five for each player. In the Blood Angels command phase on turn one, they gain a command point, going from three points up to four. There, this is a resource that can be spent throughout the game, things that are called stratagems. Stratagems are commands or special abilities that allow units to move further, shoot twice, heal, relocate, fight harder, take less damage. The variety of abilities available through these stratagems is staggering and somewhat daunting at first, with some core ones being 
available to everyone, like the ability to command point to re-roll an entire dice roll, so for example, um, a singular dice for shooting, or both dice for charging. But besides that, there are dozens of unique strategies available for each faction within the game. It is by far the hardest part to learn, remember, and master, so don't feel bad when it seems like it's a lot to take in. I felt the same way and still do to an extent after playing quite a few games of Warhammer. All of these stratagems can be found in the codex for your army, which is these fancy books here, but there are resources online that Games Workshop probably don't want you to use, like Wahapedia, where they have them written out. There is an app coming from Games Workshop, an official app with a rules lookup function for subscribers, which I'm quite looking forward to, but when that actually lands and that function works, is anyone's guess because it's already been delayed. Personally, I love the codices. They are a rich book filled with lore, art, rules. They're, they're really nice, very similar to Dungeons & Dragons books in their feel, if you're familiar with those, but buying them now is a little bit iffy, as we're undoubtedly going to see new codexes and no, or codices for each fraction throughout 9th edition, starting from, well, next month going onwards. So, so that's going to be spread out over a 24-month window. So purchasing them now, you don't get the full bang for buck, but at the same time, they are just quite nice books. Stratagems are one of my favourite new things coming back to the hobby. Having points, resources to manage and, uh, and apply gives a lot of agency to players to make clutch plays, decision trees, and just to develop unique approaches to gameplay and strategies. And I really, really love it. So, I kind of got sidetracked talking about extra bits, but that's the command phase over where not a lot happens, even if I have waffled a little bit. We then move to the movement phase. In the movement phase, you go through your entire army, moving them how you want to based upon the information on their data sheet. Data sheets can be found in your codex, in the instances that come in most modern boxes of Warhammer 40,000 for quick reference, and on the websites and apps that, again, Games Workshop don't want you to use, like Wahapedia and Battlescribe. In the movement phase, there are three choices of movement. Firstly, a basic move, where you move your unit up to its distance that's on the character sheet here. Or, you can choose to advance, where you command the unit to sprint, accelerate, focus, or just hunker down a bunker run like you're getting Gears of War. In essence, advancing gets you extra movement distance, but it stops the unit from being able to shoot or charge later in the turn, unless they have the abilities that get around that. To advance, you roll a d6 and add that to the movement, the normal movement on the character sheet. In this case, the Marines roll a 3 and get a bonus inch due to being a Blood Angel, an ability that the specific army gets as a faction-wide bonus, so they get to move 10 inches as opposed to the normal 6, but they cannot fire here. That said, there are rules on certain characters that allow them to advance and shoot to advance and charge. There are guns you can give your units, so every gun has a different um, stat line, essentially, as you can see here. There are rapid-fire guns that are better when you are close combat, because you can fire more shots easily with a hand aim, whilst uh, assault weapons can be fired from the hip whilst running, whilst advancing. So if you equip all your guys with assault weapons, you get a, you get the ability to shoot whilst moving, or advancing should I say, but with a minus one to hit. Meanwhile, rapid fire weapons will give you more shots usually. There's a lot of back and forth on what these things do. So you can equip your army in ways that allow you to be maneuverable if you want to. The third movement option is to stand still or remain stationary as the rules refer to it. This is a literal action as inaction is as much action as direct action. So remember that next time you don't pick up your friend for their subtly racist remark at dinner. This action matters due to a few different units or faction specific benefits. Marines can fire more shots with their boulder guns instead Stationary, for example, so I mentioned earlier how rapid fire guns fire more shots at half the range. Well, Marines get those more shots if they stand still as well. Almost commonly across all factions, infantry units will fire at a minus one to hit on heavy weapons unless they remain stationary. And that's it. That's your movement options. There are other rules for transports and aircraft and more advanced stuff, but I don't want to bog down this video by getting into the weeds with every single bit of minutia. You go through your army, picking units, moving them, pick a unit, move them, pick a unit, move them, or, or remain stationary, of course. And once completed, we move on to the next phase, which is the psychic phase, where we have to cast some spells. Mephiston here is a librarian, but not the boring bookkeeping kind, nor the sexy Lego figurine kind. But librarians are actually the psychers of the Space Marine faction. Mephiston's character sheet says he can manifest two psychic powers a turn, so firstly, he decides to manifest Wings of Sanguinius. When you attempt to manifest any psychic power, you roll 2d6 and attempt to roll higher than the power's warp charge. As you can see here in the book, wings the warp charge of 5, we roll and we successfully roll over the needed number. The ability manifests and we resolve it as the rules state. Mephiston can immediately move an additional 12 inches and he gains the ability to fly into the start of the next psychic phase, which means he can fly over terrain and enemy models one moving during the next movement phase. 
He next tries to use for his second power for the turn. Not, not all psychics have two powers, but Mephiston is like a super psychic, so he gets two. He's going to try and smite these Necrons in front of him. Smite is an ability every psychic has access to in 9th edition, an 18 inch range warp charge 5 ability, which when resolved inflicts D3 mortal wounds on an enemy unit. If the result of the test for smite specifically is 10 or more, it's D6 wounds. It becomes super smite, as we colloquially call it. Mephiston manifests it, the ability goes off, and we roll to wound, and apply those wounds to the enemies, killing some models. If psychic powers seem strong, it's because they really, really are, but there are some downsides and some counterplay. One of the big downsides is that if a psychic rolls a double one or a double six, then the psychic takes D3 mortal wounds themselves. This is called a Perils of the Warp. When the spellcaster is damaged by demons within the warp, or the crackling, bustling energy they try to manifest is a bit too unwieldy. The important thing about mortal wounds that smite inflicts, or this perils of the warp inflicts, is that mortal wounds ignore your general saves. We're going to come to armor saves in a moment, but you don't get to save against mortal wounds, they just, they just damage you. Fiston here has six wounds, so a perils could potentially half his health in one go. Now obviously you've got to roll a double one or a double six, and then roll a, roll a three, but it can happen. How D3s are normally handled is that you roll a D6 and half the total rounded up. So 1 and a 2 is 1, a 3 and a 4 is 2, and a 5 and a 6 is 3. Then, if the Psycho dies to the perils, they kind of explode, inflicting just D3 mortal wounds on every unit within 6 inches of the Psycho 2. So yeah, Psycho getting a perils test when they're low on health can be devastating. I guess being a space wizard is a risky business. In addition to this, enemy psychers can fight back and attempt to deny a psychic ability. The Necrons here don't have any psychic characters that can do this. This is called a Deny the Witch test. The opposing psycho rolls 2d6, and if the result is higher than what the original psycho rolled for their spell, it cancels or denies or counterspells the ability to use some magic terminology. Whilst Mephiston is an absolute machine of a wizard and can deny two different abilities each turn, again, that's not what all psychics can do, just what powerful ones can do. Uh, it's specified in the codex on his character sheet. Each ability can only have one deny the witch attempt against it. So if someone is casting two spells, Mephiston can try and deny each one once, but he can't try and deny one twice. This hard and fast rule is, each ability can only be attempted to be denied once, the opponent only gets one shot, so they have to make it count, just like JLS once suggested. Once all the wishy-washy magic is out of the way, it's time to fire some guns in the shooting phase. Much like movement, you go through each of your units deciding where to fire, resolving that firing, then moving to the next unit. Let's fire these bolt rifles on these intercessors as an example. We're within range of the 30 inches, and we're actually within half range of 15 inches, so because they are rapid fire like I mentioned earlier, each marine is going to get to fire twice. Like I said, there are different weapons with different weapon types in the game, all explained within the core rules document that's linked to, from heavy, to blast, to rapid fire, to assault, and to pistol. I think that's all of them. This number here tells us the number of shots, and as we're under half range, we're going to double it. That's a lot of shots. We need to roll equal to or higher than their ballistic skill to hit. This is how good they are at firing their guns, how well trained they are, how accurate they are. 3 plus gives us more than a 50% chance to hit, which is great. So here's the fun part. We roll some dice. We land a load of hits, so now it's time to see if these landed shots are strong enough to wound or take down an opposing metal lad. We take the hits and we roll these dice again for the wound rolls. Check to see if the weapon's strength against the opposing toughness of the enemy creature to see if it kills it. These bolt guns are strength 4 against a toughness 4 model like a Necron Warrior, means we're wounding 50% of the time on a 4 up. There is a super handy chart that's on screen now, that's also in the core rules document that's linked to below. The easy way to try and like click in your head is that double strength versus toughness is a 2 up. Uh, greater strength, so a 7 strength versus a 4 strength, for example, would be a would be a 3 up. If it's equal, it's a 4 up. And if your strength is lower than your opposing toughness, so if you're shooting this bolt rifle into, I don't know, a tank, or like a big robot or monster, it's going to be potentially lower, 5 up. And if it's half, if that tank or robot is really big, it's a 6 up. This grid makes all that very easy to understand. So we're looking for fours, we land some, and now the defending player gets to see if the unit's inherent resilience, its physiology or its armor, saves it. Necron warriors have an armor save of four up, but the gun they're being shot by, a bolt rifle, has an armor piercing value of minus one, as we can see on the character sheet. So you take the normal save, and you reduce it by one to a five up. They make their save and they fail some, which means some of these weapons got through as wounds. Each hit lands at one damage or one wound apiece, and then the opposing enemy unit removes some models. You then rinse and repeat 
until everything on your army is fired. Some tanks will fire 30 or 40 shots. Some squads will fire 30 or 40 shots. Some units don't even have guns because they're only melee units and the Tyranids or the, or the demons or even some Blood Angel characters don't have guns. And then we move on to the charging phase. Now, this isn't charging up like, like, you know, Dragon Ball Z power levels. This is declaring a charge and moving towards your enemy like in Braveheart. You can declare a charge if you are within 12 inches of an enemy unit. You roll 2d6, add them together. If the number reached would put you within one inch, within one inch of the enemy unit, you have succeeded. You are now within engagement range. If you can't get within one inch, also known, like I said, as engagement range, you fail. They're just under seven inches away, so they need a six to get within an inch. And we roll a five, so they failed. However, they're blood angels. Again, every army and faction has special rules. The Necrons, for example, can reanimate corpses on their turn. It says so in their codex. The Blood Angels get a plus one to charges and advances, like I said earlier. So we roll the five, plus one is six. We're just under seven inches away, so we're now within an inch of our opponent. Again, much like movement and shooting, you rotate through your whole army, picking units to charge with until all have been complete, whether they failed or succeeded. Once charges are done, we move to the fight phase. In the fight phase, all units that charge get to fist fight first, giving a strong advantage to those who took the initiative to get in and start the fight. After which, you take it in turns, starting with the opponent, to alternate through eligible units that can fight. So if you charge a unit and don't kill it, it gets to fight back. With some units, that means they're going to kill you. So charging can be risky. This and around the only parts of the game in, in, in 40k where you alternate between players as opposed to just resolving all your stuff in your turn. Our marines charged so they get to fight. To start the fight phase, a unit can pile in three inches, allowing each of its models within the unit to get closer to the enemy and then are able to fight. A model can only fight is if it is touching another model or it's half an inch away from a friendly model but it's half an inch away from an enemy. This represents people fighting in ranks or swinging over the shoulders of its allies and similar things like that. Once we've piled in, we roll some attacks. Much like shooting, we must roll hits, wounds and then let them save. However, the stats for these are on the model's character sheet, not on a separate gun like the guns were. Attacks being this A number here on the data sheet. So these Primaris Marines get two attacks each and the sergeant gets three. And they all get plus one from an ability called Shock, which is a unique thing that all Space Marines have. If they're charged or charged or another thing called a heroic intervention that we're going to today, they get an extra attack. That means there's three per model and four per sergeant. So that's 16 attacks. And because we have no melee weapons on our profiles, we use our base strength to determine if we wound. It's a weapon skill of three up, so ballistic skills for shooting, weapon skills for melee. This means we hit on a three, so we roll some dice. Strength four of the marines versus toughness four of the necrons means we'd wound on fours, and our opponent gets to make four plus saves on our rifle butts, teeth, and fists because they don't have any armor pen. They make some saves, fail others, they allocate wounds to models, and they remove them appropriately. Each Necron can only take one wound, so for each damage that gets through, a Necron is killed. There is some more unique stuff that I don't want to go too into here, where if your sword or power fist or whatever does three damage a hit, if a hit wounds, that's three damage to one model. So if you do three damage with one swing of a sword, because all the other hits missed, it only kills one model. A model being an individual model within the unit, where a unit being a collection of models. This means that one sword doing three damage can't kill three models. The one sword hit does three damage to one model, killing it. The next sword hit can be allocated to the next model, and so on and so on. That is something that perhaps I can do another video on another time, if this video is helpful. The Necrons get to fight back, same rules as before. They pile in, they hit on threes, they wound on fours, because all the stats are very similar, and the wounds have a slightly better save, so they because they're a more elite expensive unit, so they're saving on threes. They take down one of the marines. Then finally, we come to the morale phase, where units need to roll to check if they lost bodies to see if they shit themselves and flew the battlefield. Taking it in turns, alternating between units that have took casualties this turn, you roll a d6 for each unit, and add to that d6 the number of models that were killed. Unmodified ones will always succeed a morale check. If the morale test number exceeds the unit's leadership, one of the models flees, then each subsequent model takes a combat attrition test. Now, I, the, the units I've set up here actually aren't that great for this because marines are very good at saving morale, so are necrons. Necron warriors have a leadership stat of 10, which means that you'd have to roll uh, a 6 plus a 5. You'd have to have lost 5 models. And for the, for, the, for the purpose of this video, I've obviously put 5 warriors down, so that's not actually possible to do. In the game, warriors can only be fielded in squads of 10. It's just the models I had available. Big shout out to Adam, by the way, for lending me some models to make this video. Let's just say, hypothetically, we failed. 
Let's talk about what happens then. On a fail, a model would flee. A singular model would run off down the battlefield and get cut down by gunfire or a stray bullet or something and just disappear off the board. Then, under 9th edition rules, what we'd do is we'd roll a d6 for each subsequent model after the failure. Each roll of a 1, that model flees. This is called a combat attrition test. If the model's under half strength, so for example this was a 10-man squad of warriors, down to 5 or lower, you subtract 1 from that roll, so basically a model flees in a 1 or a 2. And that, my friends, it's a turn of Warhammer. The Necrons move, they shoot, they charge, and they fight, and everyone checks morale, and that's the end of battle round one. We go on to battle round two, and then you rinse and you repeat until one force is dead, or until the end of battle round five, where victory points are checked to see who actually is the winner of the game. Something I haven't gone into great detail here in the video is how missions work within 40k. When you get ready to play with a friend, you'll pick a mission out of the book, or one of the missions that you can find online, which will have objectives both primary and secondary. The primary objectives, like this Necron corpse here, are physical objects on the board that you need to control in order to gain victory points. You, to control them, you need to have more units on them than your opponent. You're, you're contesting it, but you're winning it because you have more units. In this example here from our previous battle, if the Blood Angels get the Sanguinary Guard troops onto the objective in their turn, they must survive to the next turn because it's only checked at the end of the command phase. This is a big change from 8th edition to 9th. This means the Blood Angel player is going to gain some points if the Necron player can't get them off the objective. It's one of the biggest strategic elements of Warhammer 40,000, and it's been changed, like I said, from 8th to reward you for, for having bodies that can survive a huge amount of fire, or if you can stop them getting shot at. But it also gives your opponent the option to make a choice. They can either try to destroy a large lumbering battle tank or, or monster that's coming towards the enemy lines, or they can fire further downfield at objectives or maneuver to kill things on objectives. Again, more agency, more strategic choice, and more of what makes the game great. And that, my friends, is the simplified bare bones turn order of a 40k turn. With the information in this video and some data sheets from the Codices, Wahapedia, Battlescribe, or the official Games Workshop app, whenever that comes round, you can easily play some Warhammer 40,000. You need some dice, a tape measure, and some scenery, but I mean, you can use sandwich boxes and, 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 and cans of drink for scenery if you really wanted to. If you want to hear me talk about army construction, or my first voyage back into modeling and painting, then check out the playlist for Warmer Wednesdays, the cards, and the description of this video. I also did a video last week, Price up the starter kits in terms of their points within the point system of 9th edition. I've also done a video talking about points versus power level and about why I like combat patrol, the smallest army size, the 500 point army size, which will be armies similar to the size of what you've seen in these games, maybe a little bit smaller. A link will show for that on screen now. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a like and comment telling me what you thought of the video and what you'd like to see in future from me and Warhammer Wednesdays. This video was a quite a bit more work than my normal Warhammer Wednesday videos, and it's me trying to proof of concept that I can do a battle report that could be interesting by filming models on a board. So please do share this video around with your friends wanting to learn the basics of Warhammer or, or get into the hobby. Sharing videos like this is definitely the best way to support a creator. Until next time, be good to one another, and I'll see you all soon, especially next Wednesday, for more Warhammer Wednesdays. Ta-ta for now.